modern knowledge. And on the other hand, it involves our Torah. So, in other words, Islamization is relevant for modern knowledge. You cannot say, I want to Islamize the Quran and Hadith. Right? You cannot say, I want to Islamize Fiqh and Usul Fiqh. Right? So, in IIUM, for the last 10-15 years, we have also been, been uh, looking at what this integration process means. Or actually before what the Islamization process meant. Okay? And we found out that in kulia like economics, we can talk about Islamization. But in the kulia of Islamic reveal knowledge and human sciences, from where Prof. Abdulaziz Barhud is based, you, you cannot talk about Islamization, especially for the Islamic reveal knowledge. So in IIUM, what they, what they came up with is this term called relevantization. Okay? So as, as we will try to show, integration of knowledge requires us to have these two sub-processes. One is dealing with modern knowledge. We want to Islamize it. Yeah, because as Abdul, uh, Prof. Abdulaziz Barahud said, Islamization of knowledge is all about interaction. It is not about total rejection of everything in the last uh, 300 years from Western Europe. It is interaction. So, but we want to interact critically. Right? So, we call that process Islamization. But what do we do and how do we Islamize? It must be based on a reference point. That reference point is the Torah, the Islamic heritage, the Quran, the Hadith. But the Quran, the Hadith, and especially the interpretation of the scholars regarding what you find in our sources of knowledge in the Quran, Hadith, this also cannot 100% be the same as it was 1,000 years ago and what it is today. There is a need for this ishtihad, as Prof. Abdulaziz Barahud said. So what do we need to do? So after a lot of discussion among people in Kulia of Islamic Review Knowledge and Heritage, uh, during the time of uh, Prof. Kamal Hassan as our rector, they came up with this term, relevantization. So what you want to do with our heritage is you want to make it relevant for contemporary situation. All right? Now, we may not agree fully. We may say why this word, not that word. Why not contextualization? Why not? You can, many, many other terms can be, can be used. But that's what the university came up with. And so we are going to focus on this, right? And what I want to do, I want to try and connect it to Islamic economics and finance. Uh, why? Because, well, this is what this camp is all about. And all of you, I think, if you are not in economics programs, you may be in finance or management or some related. And so let's try to go through these uh, few slides. I also like to f continue from Prof. Abdulaziz Barhud that there is a need for us to present solutions to the problems that we face in economics, in finance. Right? And as many of you, I hope you are keeping up with the discussions and debates, there is a big debate about modern economics and finance um, is actually not able to resolve centuries-old problems. For example, yesterday's session with Prof. Zia, the whole discussion about inequality and poverty. Right? Despite all the discussion about Millennium Development Goals, now Sustainable Development Goals, there is enough evidence, enough data, as was mentioned yesterday, to show that inequality has actually <coughs> increased in the world. Poverty, despite the fact that, yes, many people may have been taken out of poverty, but it is still rampant in a big way 
in many countries. Yeah? So the current system, which claims to be value-free, yeah? the, the current economics textbooks that we use in universities, they make the claim that they are dealing with positive economics. They don't deal with normative economics. They don't deal with the what should be. Right? So they make a claim that it is value free. Right? And we, we, we can't accept this, this base. So yesterday Zia was telling us, why do we need to accept these disciplines as, as shown to us, as given to us? We should be critically evaluating this discipline. Right? So, is there a need for a values or ethics based economics and finance? I'm sure everybody will say yes. Including some people even in modern economics. They will say yes. Right? We need this value base. Is the, the crisis that keeps happening more and more often, right? What causes it? So this very famous thing, it came out, I remember, in 2009 or 2010. There was a, there was a, a occasion where the Queen, yeah, the Queen of England, went for a briefing about the financial crisis in, two, in, in 2008, the subprime mortgage crisis. And when they were explaining to her what happened, she asked that question. You know, I mean, it, it's actually a very excellent question. Because there are all these professors of economics and finance and, and you know, all these uh, big organizations, research institutes that do a lot of forecasting, yeah, that do a lot of predictions, and yet we still had the crisis. So the Queen asked, why didn't anybody notice this problem? If, if you say that, you know, these are the reasons, why before it happened, we didn't notice it. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons, can you just tell me quickly, what, what is the, what were the problems of the crisis, if you remember? Surprise. 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 So, so what caused that crisis? Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. Greed. Debt. Debt. Securitization. Securitization. Okay. Huh? Derivatives, all right. So some of the causes were economic causes. Yeah, economic causes. Example: people who are not supposed to buy a house at, let's say, value of uh, half a million dollars, because the interest rate was so low, they were given the impression that they could afford it. So, you take more loan than you should. Right? And then equally, I can also afford the second house, etc., etc. So, this is an economic issue. <clears throat> High levels of debt. Alright? High le So, once you start taking in more than you can, than you can absorb, you get caught in debt problems. Right? And then when, when the, when the property market crashes, etc., you are left with this huge debt that you need to pay and you can't pay. So people become bankrupt and so on and so on. Right? So these are the economic reasons. Now, the other reasons that you mentioned are also there. Uh, greed, uh, derivatives, etc. etc. But there's also ideological causes for the crisis. Alright? Now, what are these ideological uh, examples? Firstly, the belief the belief. So why didn't anybody notice the crisis? Because the mainstream economics, the people who run Wall Street, they had a belief. And I put belief in inverted commas because belief is not supposed to be a science. Right? But they had a belief that everything was going well. That our economics, that mainstream economics that is so sophisticated with its mathematical formulation, cannot go wrong. So it was a belief. Yeah, a belief. Of course, when the, when the crisis happened, a lot of people criticize your beliefs are wrong, your, your, your model is wrong, etc. But before that, why did it continue? It was a belief. 
the assumption. So this is an assumption that we make in, in mainstream economics. Right? Now when I'm using this term mainstream economics, please connect it also to what Zia said yesterday. It's part of the capitalist framework. And the capitalist framework always talks about markets, free markets. Right? Although everybody knows markets are really not free. Right? But, but that's, that's part of the assumptions that we make. So the markets would solve all problems. If our interest rates were too low, then more demand, and when there is more demand, interest rates will go up. Right? And vice versa. So markets will solve everything. That, that's another very important part of the, the, the framework that we are teaching in universities, that we are studying in universities. Right? The markets will solve all problems. Somebody mentioned this. Accepting or recommending greed as a good characteristic or trait in economics. Right? Any, anybody saw this movie Wall Street? Yes. Right? So if you remember uh, in the movie, they basically argue, the, 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 the primary character of the movie, he says, greed is good. Yeah? You want to play the markets, you must have this trait of being greedy. Okay? So economics and especially finance promotes the idea that greed is good. Now, when you contrast it with all ethical systems in the world, whether you want to start with uh, uh, Greek uh, philosophers, that talked about virtues and vices, or you want to talk about uh, the, the, the discussion of virtues and vices that we have in Islamic literature, all scholars and ethical philosophies will never say greed is good. Greed is a vice. It is not a virtue. Yeah? It, is, it is one of the uh, vices that for example, Imam al-Ghazali will talk about as being one of the sifat uh, madhmuma. Yeah? It is not mahmuda. It is not a good trait. It is a vice. And yet, in economics, we are presenting it as something good. So, it, 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 is, it is not a value-based discipline as it is now. Okay? But that was promoted in the literature. And we also, in a way, we teach it in class when we talk about the, the rational economic man that is at the base of our models, right? The characteristic of rational economic man is that he is only interested in his own self-interest. Sometimes they say self-interest, sometimes they will say selfish interest. They put both together. They don't make a distinction. Yeah? So, that's supposed to be what economic man does. And that is why greed is good. Because the goal is to maximize. Right? And finally, and this is what maybe the derivatives and, and what caused the crisis to, 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 to blow, it is ethically okay. In fact, only okay. If you don't do it, you are irrational. It is ethically okay to transfer risk in order to maximize your own gains. So if I have a product, I know it is a terrible product, I want to sell it off, even though I know it's going to hurt the other person. Right? Now, all of these four things, while you can call it economics, but actually it is something to do with the value system of that economics and finance that we have today. And these are the things people say caused the crisis. All right? Now, what would be the Islamic view regarding these value positions? And certainly, we don't accept all of this. I, I, at least, I don't think so. Yeah? So, is there a need for a values or an ethics based economics? Yes. Is Islamic economics a solution? Of course, you are not in this camp to say no, right? You are here to say yes. 
If anybody says no, please give them their ticket. They can do that. <laughs> so we say yes. Not yet. Yeah? Not yet. Not yet. We didn't arrive at the conclusion. Ah, okay. No, no, but we say yes. No, no, you have to say yes. <laughs> right? This is our belief. Right? And that is why in Islamic economics, we don't have a problem by saying economics is value loaded. It's not value free. Right? Islamic economics will never say that Islamic economics is value free. Because there is no such thing as a value free science. Every positive aspect of a science has a normative framework. Okay? So, we, every fact is within a normative framework. How you interpret the fact is very, very important. But we must also...